thank you, Luke. Um, uh, colleagues, good afternoon. Luke, I'm glad you mentioned um, the plaque to Peter Fryer. Uh, his book was evidently uh, a major turning point in our understanding of our relationship with imperialist and colonialist uh, Britain. Um, as a young person, um, activist growing up in different parts of this country and engaging in struggles to build communities of resistance, um, I was also hugely indebted to people such as Professor James Walvin, um, uh, Edward Thompson, and his making of the English working class, CLR James, um, and, 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 and more recently, Hakim Adi, Professor Hakim Adi, uh, but which I'll say a bit more later. Um, um, and of course, uh, Walter Rodney, Hilary Beckles, David Olosoga. The work of all of those people, academics and activists, particularly Walter Rodney, who remained grounded at all times um, and was taken away from us far too soon by the fascist Burnham regime in Guyana. Um, all of those help, help in my view, uh, help us to understand where we are just now um, and, and the backwardness of this Windrush um, narrative. Um, I want to take you, my friends and comrades, on a journey. Um, and, 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 and I hope you would stay with me because through that journey, I want you to try and understand why I am so implacably opposed to this whole, the, to, to this whole Windrush business. And I think we, sh we, we, we should all be, um, whether we are from the African diaspora, the Asian and particularly South Asian diaspora, or indeed progressive white people within, within Britain who do, not, who do not identify with the struggles and, and machinations of post-colonial and continuingly imperialist Britain. So I was born in the minute, minuscule island of Grenada in the Caribbean Sea. Um, 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 exactly three months, sorry, three months and three years before that boat docked in Tils Tilbury in, 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 in 1948. Um, and my early life was interesting and, and it's interesting in this context, which is why I'm sharing it. At the age of three months, my father left Grenada to go and work refining oil in the Dutch West Indies, uh, Aruba as did many of his generation, not just from Grenada, but from across the Caribbean. I did not see him again until I was six years old. He returned to Grenada in 1951, having spent years working hard in that oil fields owned by the Lago Oil Company in Aruba, saving money which he sent home to my mother, who continued to be a peasant farmer in his absence and to run a little grocery store in our village. He was totally functionally illiterate. My mother could do better. Uh, and I remember even as a child, wondering how it was that my father had to depend upon his peers in that oil refinery in Aruba to write letters to his loving wife, my mother. 
he could not do so himself. Why was, why was that the case? Why had he not been educated? He had not been schooled because his mother gave him to a godmother to rear and bring up because she was so poor and could not, could not maintain all of her children. But what did she do? She was beginning to build a bakery uh, 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 facility. And so she had him at the age of five running around the, uh, the forests in the area in which he lived, gathering wood as fuel to heat the ovens in which she baked her bread as she built up that trade in, uh, in, 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 in the bakery. So he never went to school. But thank the universe, he was a strong, determined, self-assured man with high integrity who never allowed poverty to defeat him or to define him. And I shall be eternally grateful to my father for who he was for what he gave to me, for what he gave to the world. So he and all the people of his generation were used to migrating. They went to the, to the oil fields of South Trinidad. They helped to build the Panama Canal. They worked in sugarcane plantations in Cuba. They picked fruit as seasonal laborers in the United States of America. That, that was, so labor, labor identified them all. And why was that so? In a country that made British enslavers filthily rich. Laura Trevelyan recently went to Grenada and offered the government there some measly sum of money in acknowledgement of what her slave owning ancestors did and what they derived from the sweat, blood and death of my, of my ancestors. The fact of the matter is that whether we're talking about Grenada, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Jamaica, any one of those islands, they were defined by imperialism and colonialism. I am of the Caribbean. I am from the Caribbean, but not of the Caribbean. Those people who were indigenous to the Caribbean, Caribs and Arawaks, Amerindians and so forth, they were all exterminated in the genocide that, con that constituted the barbarism of colonialism and imperialism. So my identity cannot be other than African. I, 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 I became identified with Grenada because my ancestors were brought there in shackles from Africa by Britain. So that when I trace the, the, the trajectory of, 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 of my parenthood and the rest of it, I cannot separate what happened to my father's grandfather from how he was and from what he, he, was, he was insistent that I should not be. He was born in 1908. His father had been one of those apprentices who had to work for over 10 years after the abolition of the trade in enslaved Africans, before he himself could consider himself free. Meanwhile, those who enslaved him were paid ginormous amounts of money, 20 million pounds across, across the region, billions in today's money for loss of property. That property being 
our ancestors. It is as if somebody had shot the horses or made them jump over a precipice to their death. Loss of property. So that when Arthur Lewis, Nobel laureate from the island of St. Lucia, wrote his little book, Labor in the West Indies, originally as a pamphlet meant for the Fabian Society in London. Arthur Lewis, as an economist, was describing the conditions in which the majority of people, not just in Grenada, but across the region, actually subsisted. And he described the labor struggles and the labor insurrections that were prevalent and spread around the region in the 1930s up to about 1939, the start of the Second World War. And when you read Arthur Lewis's Labor in the West Indies, you, 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 you can't but be amazed and scandalized at how those people were being made to work in order to exist in the face of all of that wealth that had been taken away from them, brought back to Britain, and remained in the keep of those who succeeded them as plantation owners in those islands. Okay, so I'm talking, and, and <coughs> Arthur Lewis was talking about conditions that were prevalent in the Caribbean nine years before that boat arrived in, in, in Tilbury Docks in East London. And even from within those conditions, Britain managed to recruit masses of people from across the region to assist it in fending off the expansion of Nazism. They gave their lives on the battlefields of Europe in huge numbers, as others before them had done in the 19 to 14, 1914 to 1918 war. And having been demobbed, in 1914 and 18, they sought as a right, as a right to remain in Britain. In Cardiff, where I am just now, in South Shields, in East, in, in North Tyne, in Tyneside, in Manchester, in Liverpool, in Bristol. And what they faced was the, the relentless racism, systemic cultural, institutional, personal within the British state and the British population. So that between 1919 and 1939, there was a growing population of black people here in Britain. Between 19 and 1939, there were struggles with people here in this country, black people, like Henry Sylvester Williams and others, struggling for the independence of those nation states that had been colonized by Britain. And that is what led to the 1945 Pan-African Congress in Manchester with Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame in Krumer, Jomo Kenyatta, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, and many others. And what were they struggling for? The independence of the territories that Britain had colonized, from which they had come. And also an end to the color bar here in Britain a color bar that, that was in full bloom as a result of the presence 
of those Africans who had fought for Britain's freedom in two world wars. So the Windrush, the Windrush narrative is reductive, it is backward, it is in many cases reactionary, and above all, it is totally colonial when considered against the history that I'm trying to outline. And we, we, we have to understand that really, as I think uh, uh, Steve was intimating, it served the British state well to encourage that, that, that narrative. Okay, so in 1947, two boats arrived in Britain, the Ormond docking at Southampton in June 1947, the Almanzora docking in Liverpool in December 1947, both carrying some 250 people from the Caribbean who had been demobbed there after 1945. Demobbed into a situation of penury, destitution, having to throw themselves on the mercy of the local populations that they had rejoined, many of them needing prostheses and, and, and a high level uh, 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 medical care because of the injuries that they had sustained during the war and not finding it. So they were coming back to Britain. And the only difference between them and their arrival and the Windrush was that Pathé News happened to be in Tilbury Docks on the 21st of June, 1948, when that, when that boat arrived. On that boat, the Windrush, there were an equivalent number of people who had been demobbed after the Second World War returning to Britain, as those on the Ormond and the Almanzora had done months before. So where does the Windrush narrative come from? One man, RAF veteran, Sam King from Jamaica, determined that he didn't want to be part of a colony anymore. He has written it in his own book. He didn't want to be part of a colony anymore. He didn't want his children to grow up in a colony. So he was coming back to Britain and wanting to rejoin the RAF regiment that he had belonged to. And he determined before he got on that boat, the Windrush, that the Windrush would be the modern day Mayflower. Now, anybody who knows or who can research the history of the Mayflower and where that came from, where it, where it landed and what it did when it landed there would, 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 would understand very clearly that Sam King's was a delusionary mind chasing an illusion. Let's, let's be blunt about it. Whatever, whatever contribution he may have made to Britain and its, 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 its safety and its future, et cetera, that was the reality. It was ahistorical. That's my point. It was ahistorical and it, it, it was beginning to spin a history that served the purposes of the nation state in Britain and, and, and did nothing at all for those who were left in the Caribbean, or indeed those who had been here before that boat arrived. Because the Windrush narrative suggests that those who came did not have a history. The history that I've just tried to outline of destitution, of underdevelopment of their territories by slavery and colonialism, Th those countries were left economically dispossessed 
And so those who came here, never mind this talk about Britain advertising and, and loyal colonial subjects coming to help the motherland recover and be prosperous again. The fact of the matter is that those who came were coming out of destitution. They were not enjoying generational wealth on account of the labor of the ancestors. That was for the slave owners and their descendants to do. They, wanted, they were not enjoying opportunities for all of their children to get the kind of education to which they were entitled. So this romanticizing of people coming and arriving here and building up Britain is complete and utter hogwash. And where does that go? So having separated those people from that history of labor, exploitation, dispossession, destitution, it then suggests that as patriotic servants, they came here to build Britain. But my friends, let us remember this. In 1948, when Britain passed the 1948 Nationality Act, it had two choices, at least two choices. It could have determined there and then that as a result of colonialism and imperialism, it had a moral duty if not a legal one, to embrace and confront the legacy of empire. And that legacy related both to the native British population of whites, whom it had imbued with knowledge, with, with some notion of their supremacy as white people, enjoying all kinds of privileges, and the, 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 the Blacks, whose exploitation and extermination it had justified on the basis that we were not totally human. Britain could not have done what it did to us, to me and my ancestors and the rest of us, without impacting upon its own white British population. They were contaminated by racism. Racism was etched into the DNA of the nation as a result of imperialism and colonialism. And after two world wars, where Britain was supposed to be about defeating Nazism and for, it was clamoring for freedom and justice and the rest of it, it had a responsibility to understand, remember, and make reparations for the fact that it itself had been more than fascist in its dealing with African people. That was the reality. But rather than confronting the legacy of empire and asking the question, what is the role of schooling and education in confronting the legacy of empire? How does schooling and education, how can it be structured in such a manner that it engages with what colonialism and imperialism was about and foregrounds the right of black people, even if they were not in the country, to be self-determining, to develop their own epistemologies, knowledge production, knowledge dissemination, and the rest of it, knowledge validation, especially as colonialism and imperialism had erased all of that and made the world to believe that African civiliz civilization did not exist. That the universities of Timbuktu and, 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 and Sond Sondai and so forth were a myth. So therefore, the failure to engage with the legacy of empire meant that Britain was hell-bent on continuing to, 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 to deal with the residue of empire. 
And not that was not just in the form of singing Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory and the rest of it. It was in their active systems and structures and, 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 and stratagems for embedding neo-colonialism to make sure that even the colonies that they had left when it didn't suit them to be there anymore would continue to operate in their interests, whether on the African continent or in the Caribbean. So they, they nurtured and groomed people, black leaders of black states to act in their interest. Colonialism didn't go away when Britain gave what I call flag and anthem independence to those territories. The, the issue we have therefore, especially in relation to this Windbridge business, in terms of determining why did these people come here at that particular time? What did they find when they, when they came here? And what political and ideological position did they adopt in relation to the British state? These are the fundamental questions. Because unless we, 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 we delve into that, there are certain things that we just won't understand. So people came, people like my father, my mother who joined him three years after he came in 1957. They did menial jobs, jobs which white people didn't want to do anymore after the Second World War. Ghastly working conditions, long hours. There was a time when the, the only people who seemed to be doing night duty were those black recently arrived migrants. So white Britain was determining after the, 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 these world wars, et cetera, we, we have a right to progress. The British exported lots of them to Australia and it filled the gaps with that reserve pool of labor that it had nurtured in the Caribbean since the end of enslavement. And that's what they were. People had, in some cases, uh, a seasonal employment. More often than not, the majority of the population was unemployed. And many people were dying as a result of sitting around and drinking too much rum. Death of aspiration, death of hope, destruction of hope. And Hillary Beckles writes eloquently about all of that when he talks about the underdevelopment of the Caribbean. Walter Rodney talked about how Europe underdeveloped Africa. And so my point is that it is convenient for the British state to try and obliterate all of that history and indulge those descendants of Africans in Britain here who consider that they've been worthily rebuilding Britain, causing Britain to be multiracial and, 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 and generally helping the mother country. Complete and utter backwardness. Okay, so what, 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 what have we, what have we, where have we got to? What have we found? By deciding not to embrace the legacy of empire that I was, I was talking about earlier, Britain made a choice to do something else. It made a choice to pander to the wishes and fears of all of those who wish to keep Britain white, who were never were never taught or encouraged to understand the relationship between Britain and its colonies, the damage it had done to people in those colonies, and above all, the right of people to be here. 
I can't tell you the number of times I've been asked by people, if you have such an attitude towards the British state, why don't you go back to where you came from? And I say to them, going back to where I came from means the British getting me back to Africa and compensating me for all that those who left Africa resulted in my being on this earth did. That's what that means. So the psyche of Britain, all of those who hankered after Brexit, with, with Theresa May and, 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 and Cameron and, 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 and that lot, determining that they needed to do whatever the majority of, of British people wanted in order to satisfy them electorally. You can't understand Brexit unless you understand that particular history. 1960, the government announced that it was going to start restricting those who were coming after 1948. Between then, between 1961 and 1962, when the Commonwealth Immigrants Act came into force, 120,000 people, 125,000 came from that region as compared to the less than 1,000 who came in 1948 on that boat. And yet, these backward Windrush people want us to believe that those who came on that boat, the 500 or so of them who were from the Caribbean, were the pioneers on whose backs and on, on whose shoulders the rest of us stood to build modern Britain. Complete nonsense. And when they call them pioneers, they give no evidence whatsoever of what they did having come. You don't become a pioneer simply by landing in the country, for God's sake. What do they do? So all our, all, all our efforts after 1948, after the Pan-African Congress in 45, 1950s, riots in Notting Hill and Nottingham in 1958, the murder of Kelso Cochrane, an Antiguan worker, going about his lawful business in 1959, the police being told who the murderers were and deciding that they won't do anything about it because if they did, the, the white population would be, would be up in arms and there would be a repeat of the, of the riots in 1958. So to this day, the murderer of Kelso Cochran has walked free. But then some years later, 1981, when 13 young people are massacred in, in, in a fire in 439 New Cross Road in Deptford, the Metropolitan Police do the same thing. They had clues as to who were involved. But then they decided to turn their attention on the black people within the party itself. And nobody has been convicted of those murders either. And then 1993, Stephen Lawrence is killed going about his lawful business. And true to form, the Metropolitan Police contrive to let his murderers go free. That's the modern Britain we've been building. So, so let me let me let me yes let me <laughs> let me wind, wind up. up and yes yes we yeah. our agree our grievances there are many we could be here all day me, I let know me, let me wind up yes let please me say, let me say two things the first is this that it is cynical it is typical British hubris and hypocrisy that even as Caribbean elders were losing their lives as a result of healthcare being denied them, the government having determined that they were undocumented, we were flocking into Westminster Abbey with the same Theresa May, 
who caused the hostile environment, and with William, sometime to be king of this country, to celebrate the contribution of Caribbean people to Britain. It is as if, and of course, th that, that has been amplified in what we've seen this year. So we have uh, uh, Windrush stamps, we have Windrush coins, and even people who have been supporting Windrush victims in getting compensation from the Home Office are being rewarded with gongs for their efforts and citations of services to the Windrush generation. Now, how cynical can you get? What I'm saying, therefore, is this, that we, we talk about the Black community. We have to face those matters head on, confront the backwardness of the Windrush Foundation and all of those who sent this Windrush hair coursing around the place, and make a decision that we are going to, to continue to, to, to call on this government to acknowledge its, its, its historical wrongs and right them, and to understand that those countries that we left, we left behind are in the same position as when we left them in 1948 and after. So unless we deal with the question of reparatory justice, reparations, the distribution of generational wealth, and then show that there is non-repetition because the, the repetition is going on with all of these deaths in custody as they call them, which I call police killings that warrant charges of manslaughter or murder. If you say police killing, if you say deaths in custody, you're effectively implying that there is an unnatural propensity on the part of black people to die of natural causes when they're in the custody of the police. And that is complete nonsense. So we're talking about police killings. Mark Duggan, France in, 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 in the current period and what have you. And there are parallels between Britain and France in that respect, in terms of colonialism, reparations, reparatory justice and so forth. So my mission, my friends, my mission is to debunk, erase this whole nasty Windrush narrative and refocus on our people on preserving the rights and fundamental entitlements of the current generation of black British citizens who have nothing at all to do with Windrush and then show that the society isn't deflected from its duties and responsibilities to them by this celebratory nonsense that we have got ourselves into. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nanot. Thank you very much, Gus, for that historical and political sharing that you, you did there. I know grievances of many we could go on for hours as it raises so many questions um i'm especially pleased that you share in some ways about your dad and his experience because i think those personal stories are things that we do need to tell because the narrative or what we hear from those that are reports to pay and reparations is that it was so long ago it's they can't remember so we need to remind them we need to remember for them and i think Thank you for sharing that very personal story because it raises one of the fundamental questions really around the whole question of reparatory justice um, education. Um, and that's so crucial and it's why it's so important that we have our academics, our artists, um, our playwrights, you know, whoever involved in the arts and trying to get the information to people at the level that they can get it because so many of our people still have been denied the kind of education 
that we should be having. My own experience of it in being schooled in Guyana was that in some ways I was lucky because they, they, in 1964, they just changed the curriculum. Instead of teaching British history, we were taught West Indian history. When I read about the Atlantic trade, I was so incensed and so mad, I think. From that point on, I was ready to be a revolutionary. So education is really key to what we're doing. Um, and, you know, you mentioned many of the um, those that are writing about and um, taking political action in the Caribbean, Phil Rebecca's, Walter Rodney, you know, the late who was in the past, who have contributed so much, you know, Richard Hart, our own president of Caribbean Labor Solidarity in his book, Slaves Who Abolished Slavery. Um, you know, we, we get to have a different narrative from the ones of the Wilby Forces and the Gladstones and the who else in the UK have somehow freed us. Um, so thank you for that real big scope that you've done. It's raised so many questions. You mentioned um, Arthur Lewis, which, which uh, <laughs> reminded me that um, one of the, the people I've met in, 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 in Grenada, I'm sorry, in Jamaica just recently was um, Professor uh, Rupert Lewis, who is one who was involved with the reparations movement and with the, with the CARICOM um, take on it. Um, which we entirely support in Caribbean Labour Solidarity. And we will be looking to see how we can work closely um, from the UK when supporting what is the lead and the Hillary Beckles and others in the region are playing. That's so important. We were invited to watch a play by um, Desri Baptiste, who was a one, one show, you know, that's actually been moved to Trinidad. And it is something that we all should see because she, actually brings to life the whole experience of slavery and the reaction or the way in which the owning classes or the slave owning class um, behaved and how they enrich themselves and so on. So we need the artists out there, you know, like Tobago Crusoe who raises the question of reparations and not reparations, but the wind rush. And I've asked him to think about reparations. Um, Alexander the Great, who has brought so much to our attention with his calypsos, um, Linton Johnson, Linton, Linton, who is, you know, his England is a bitch for him and many other ways in which he has tried to inform um, people generally. Um, and, and that's very key, the, the artists. So we have always, at our meetings, invited artists to participate. And we've been lucky to have um, Crusoe and Alexander the Great perform at the, or Anne Linton perform at some of our public meetings. Some of our members have been calling for public meetings and we're hoping to pull off at least one um, before the end of the year that people can attend. Um, um, so, so, so those who live in, <laughs> nearby in the UK, because many of our People who attend these meetings now are from all parts of the world, and we really appreciate that. Before we had these Zoom meetings, our audiences were mostly from people who were based in London. So we tended to have maybe 20 people at the meeting. Now we have having 50, and at times, you know, we've had hundreds and so on. So we intend to keep building. We do miss that one-to-one -one contact. Um, it's why I've encouraged people to put questions in the, um, in the chat so we could put to you, Gus, um, because um, you've, you've raised so many issues there and so many things. Um, but I had one question for you. What would be one, I mean, you know, in the end there, you actually um, very, you know, very clear made your statement about your position on this and what we should be doing about the wind rush. You know, my fear is, is that by this celebratory mood for the wind rush, in the next five years, people will forget completely that there was a hostile environment and the way people were treated, and they will see it as just something to celebrate as though that was the intention from the word go. So I appreciate you know you you know actually putting it in a historical and 
political perspective. Um, what was one action you would suggest for the, the, the next step, as it were, in terms of challenging the narrative and trying to put the government under pressure in some way to honor the commitments they made towards the people who have been subjected to all kinds of inhumane treatment. Uh, thanks for that question, Luke. Um, one of the things that concerns me deeply about this old Wendrush narrative is that people are talking very much in the past, okay, about people who came 75 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they, they talk about it in two ways. You would be forgiven for believing that those who came on that boat constituted some kind of a massive gene pool from which the rest of us are, are, are all descended, that everything that we've done was, was in a sense uh, um, um, due to, 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 to the presence of those people. Um, the, the, the number of historical distortions and, and, and inconsistencies and um, um, non sequiturs in all of that is, 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 is simply appalling. So one wonders why it is, for example, that all of these local authorities, you know, I, like, I liken it to the George Floyd thing. Um, all of a sudden, every single institution in Britain has some kind of an epiphany and suddenly remembered that there was something called systemic racism, which informs the way that individuals behave, like police officers, like immigration officers, and so on. But we live with that every day. Those, those killings in police custody I'm talking about is one example of that. The, the disproportionate number of black students being sent to pupil referral units and excluded from schools and having their life chances ruined is another example of that. There are endless examples of what, what, I what I consider to be the restitution, sorry, the repetition I'm talking about. And what we need to do is to leave that whole damned windrush stuff in the past and determine how we are going to organize ourselves collectively in alliance with other progressive forces who want to see social justice and equity in the society to confront those systemic injustices. We, we, we are not focused on that at all, yeah? So these injustices go on and on and on relentlessly, inexorably, every single day, every single year. And then every five years we get together, the government is happy to hand out God knows how much money to this group, that and the next to celebrate. It's, it's obscene. There's no other word for it. It's just bloody obscene. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, okay, Gus, there's a lot of uh, messages. I don't know if you've had a chance to look in the message box, but um, lots of congratulations for this talk um, from Abigail Bonard, 